for coming in. Beautiful people. Good morning. Beck, I see you. Jai, it's a beautiful flannel. Beck's on the treadmill. She's already beaten us all. Callan, good to see you in here. I know Carl has some handsome hand in that, which we love. What else we got? Ox. What's up, man? What's up, homie? Andy, take your video off if you can. Kiara and Christian. Hello. Dan. One of the best physios in Melbourne. What else we got? Chotch. James. Joshua Smith. It's good to meet you, brother. Anthea Slay Woodford. Wood Woodruff. I see you. Ryan Otter. Wait. Otter.ai. Yeah, I know what that is. Why does it change your name, Ryan? That's the that's the AI transcription. That's weird. Ryan Everton, my man. You guys can unmute yourself. It's okay. I and you, if. Sorry, bro. The baby was being annoying. Oh, it's okay. How is she or he? She's great, man. She's cruising. Edmonds. <laughs> So I'm missing. There's some of you I haven't met before, but I'm looking at a screen of Matthew Gervaisi. If I said that right, but that I'm gonna get. <laughs> Can you introduce yourself? Like, Hi, how are you? It's Chloe. Oh, Mendoza. Chloe. How you going? I'm going great. I'm glad I could clarify. Sorry, I was having issues, so I just saw my partners. That's okay. I'm like, that doesn't look like a Matthew. <laughs> All right, guys. I think uh, we have no time to waste. We are going to get into this because this is going to be big. And I hope incredible for all of you and really changes the way you all look at uh, approach work because we spend most of our lives waking hours dedicated into our profession and work and we almost never think about how to optimize it and maximize it and so that's what a lot of this conversation is going to be centered around you guys are all welcome to share this on social media and just take a little uh, share screen or photo or video and share it and tag me it's completely fine i love that i need to do a big shout out uh, because if you guys click the three dots, you can change your view, I have learned, and you'll be able to see everybody if you choose to. Carl Goodman, uh, my friend, my mentor, um, who has changed uh, my life and business in, in many ways, I need to give a lot of credit and thanks for, because we would not be here without him. He was the last straw that broke the camel's back to be like, dude, you have to do this. I'm like, fine. And so if this is great, you can thank Carl. If this is not great, you can thank Carl. <laughs> put the blame on me, guys. I'm fine with that. I'm fine with that. <laughs> no, I'm playing. You definitely put put that on me. But thank you, my friend. Um, this That's is okay, a, beyond my expectations. Okay. Hello, Mary Sad. We're going to get into it. I'm going to share my screen. If you're on a phone, turn it horizontal and you can pinch to make it bigger. But I do recommend a laptop. I will, of course, record this for those who don't know. All right, let's starting off with, I want to know what is the max amount of hours in a day that all of you work before feeling uh, fatigued and tired? You can type it in the chat. I just want a number. There's no judgment. Please don't try and impress me or impress anybody. Uh, the goal is not to work more. Please remember, it's, it's to work as much as you want to create the outcome that you desire. So please let me know how many hours in a workday before you, you, you get fatigued and tired, no matter what you try. Two to four, four to five, three, four to six. Mary, that is big. That is so much better than it used to be. Rosie Ian, sorry if I said that wrong. Four to five, great. 
Sly, my boy. Two to three, four, four to five, two to three. Have a look, guys. Dan, interesting. Very interesting, Dan. Six to 12. That is definitely more to what I feel. That's really good. Back four. Mac two, okay, two to three. Okay, cool. Ape, if you can't hear me, that would be you. Because I, everyone can definitely hear me. Ox, eight. Tremendous. But, all right, thank you for that. So, Ape, just um, have a look at your audio. Your sound. So, really, this... 10% more productive every day for the next 10 years of your life. That's really going to be one of the outcomes of this presentation, this uh, masterclass. And it's going to happen if you act, guys action the things that I suggest. But the first place before we go anywhere, before we get practical on equipment and technology and, and set up and all this fancy stuff is mindset and beliefs. By far the most important thing. And so I want to start, and if you have some background noise, it would be awesome if you could mute your mic. But if you guys want to jump in and speak, please, you can do this one. You can click the little hand. You can just jump in and talk. I want this to be a conversation. So you're all welcome. I know you might be a little bit nervous to speak, but I want you guys all to feel comfortable. Like, you can jump in anytime. It's all good. I would love that. Now. Can people raise their virtual hand uh, if you've ever been made to feel bad or guilty for working a lot and hard? Just want to see. Eight, nine, 10, 11, 13, Jesus. 16. Okay. Same. It's a lot of people. I believe that most of us, I won't say us, but most people can't work a, such a long work day is because our beliefs around work are limiting. And so I want to start with a bit of engagement here. You guys can unmute, unmute yourself. I'd love that. Uh, what are some beliefs around working you learned from your parents, society, uh, family growing up? Or what have you heard? Uh, some beliefs around what you have to do, what people say you should be doing in regards to work and working hard. I'll kick us off if you want now. Thank you, Carl. Um, my dad has never worked a day in his life, um, which is which is you know we could we could dive into I suspect, but um, that certainly formed part of my. Um, my work ethic, I would say, um, is because my my dad, uh, my mum and dad divorced us too, and he's been on the dole um, every day since. Um, so it's that certainly motivated me around what I think I need to accomplish for my own family. With I have kids myself, um, because I, I don't want to have, I don't want my, my kids to have the same upbringing I did. And what was that upbringing in brief? Um, look, really short, we lived in a really low socioeconomic area. My mum worked about 65 hours a week um, across two and a half jobs. We lived in a one-bedroom apartment in, in southwest Sydney. Um, I never saw her because she was always working. So I, I went to daycare five days a week. Then I went uh, and spent every evening with the, one of the daycare teachers. So I went and spent time with their family while my mum tried to to work so it was difficult it was difficult mate um and definitely part of my work ethic is is governed by probably um governed by those experiences as a kid okay. yeah man thank you thank you for sharing that i I'm, i gotta stop myself from going deeper um what anybody else like what, what is some like like give you an example like don't work too hard right uh carl mentioned one you can put in the oh. comments or you can unmute yourself. Can I just go? I don't yeah, know how yeah. To... Hell yeah. <laughs> um, I'd probably say my upbringing is like the complete opposite of Carl's where I saw my mom work to the point of sickness. And that's almost like defined a certain ceiling as to how far I shouldn't push so I don't get sick later on in life. And you 
for those who don't know, you, you really did push and you did step into that identity very hard. And now you've, I assume, realized how to balance that obsessive work ethic. Yeah. I'd say it's like I'm trying to redefine what good work ethic looks like. Okay. Yeah. But I've always been taught, like, you just go until you can't anymore. Right. This, for if you resonate, if any of you resonate with what Mary just shared, you're going to have to filter that through a, a, a bit of a different lens for yourself, through a lens of the consequences of endlessly pushing, being mindful of the consequences of endlessly pushing and the detriments it can have to your mental, physical health. But I'm going to show you as well how we can really minimize that, at least in my life and my clients. Some other things, work smarter, not harder. You've got to enjoy life more. That is just going to make me go nuts. You'll burn out if you work too long or hard. Some of you may have seen my post around burnout and reframing our language around that, okay? So at first, these are some common things that I would like to reframe for you all. And the first one is you got to enjoy life more. Don't work so hard. Can I get a one of these ones? If we've heard a version of that, let me just see how relevant it is. Enjoy life more. Don't work so hard. Okay. I think there's, there's this pervasive idea that you have to take holidays. Yes, exactly. You need balance. Like people will put their idea of balance onto you. And this is something to be very skeptical and wary of because people put their own expectations of their life onto you. And sometimes we can do it onto other people as well. This idea that you need or should, I would like to eliminate for all of you. People say, oh, come out, come chill, man. Come out Friday night, Saturday night, have a good time. They try and pull you into the, their vortex that is sometimes often a, a, heat, a, a cycle of hedonism and distraction from their ultimate goals. And what I want you guys to all understand and what I think some of the most successful, wealthy, fulfilled people understand is that recreation is not the only way to enjoy life. Partying, movies, drugs, alcohol, sex, these are not the only ways to have and find joy. In fact, they're mostly moments of, of fleeting hedonism. I'm not saying you can't do those things. I'm saying you should engage with them with a level of conscious awareness and intention. Instead, I would ask you all, what is the, because you, most of you are entrepreneurs or very ambitious people. That's why you're here. So you can afford, you're trying to find the thing that gives you joy in life and realize that some people actually find joy in pushing themselves. Some of us actually find enjoyment out of finding our potential and seeing what we're made of. And so when someone engages with you with that, man, just why don't you enjoy life more? I would encourage you to give the perspective that life, culture, sells us on the idea that we, to enjoy life, we have to engage in hedonism, in seemingly often unhealthy habits that give moments of dopamine. Little do they know, people like me, many of you, if you find that much joy in your work, you will enjoy life more than them because you can only enjoy alcohol and drugs for a few hours before the consequences of like, I need to recover. Where if you do something like this, if you find something that is endlessly fulfilling to you, which is a different challenge in of itself, then the cycle of enjoyment and energy can maintain and be consistent. So don't let other people's expectations of, of what their life should be with enjoyment be put pressured onto you. I just want to kind of give you guys permission that we just have different ideas of, of joy and that's okay. Some people's is recreation and hedonism. Uh, mine is found in, in fulfilling my potential and, and 
being the type of man my clients, my future family, uh, my future son will look up to. A and that's okay. Oh, for those who've never been in a little workshop by me, don't freak out if I pause for like 10 seconds. It's not lagging. I'm just letting the conversation breathe and you guys jump in. So to me, the ultimate life act to energy is fine work and meaning and a higher purpose that gives you enjoyment by doing the work, by contributing. Um, and that can be found by asking yourself the question, what would you do if you were not being paid for? What would you fill your day with? And I think the analogy is like a video game. What's your modern real life video game? Because I used to be addicted to video games as a kid. Now I'm even more to life because I found my modern video game. So find your modern video game. I actually promise you, you can. If you haven't, if you are, then we'll, we'll build on that. Now it's getting clear on expectations because there's some people who want to build an empire and there's some people who just want to be free. And those two types of people will have a different classification of actions and expectations for themselves. So this is all just a, a, a framing for a setup of how you want to live your life. So I would encourage you guys all to kind of write this down for yourself and like get clear. If you're just living your life for freedom or doing your profession just to create uh, a quality of life that you desire, be able to travel somewhere, do something, that's okay. But often these people, some of you, if you're doing your profession and doing your job just to create freedom, like I just want to make 100K, 200K, just so I can hit that baseline and, and tick all my Maslow's hierarchy of needs and take care of my family. That is a very different level of intention and action to playing for the game, which some of you may have heard. So what that means is some of you, like I can, like I imagine Carl, for example, uh, some of you just love playing the game of business, of life, of progression, of the pursuit like I've given here, the Hormoses, the Gary V's. They do it because they fucking love it. You should get clear on who you would like to be and who you want to be. When I started, I wasn't, I loved the game, but I wasn't like, like completely like what I am now. And so it's grown a lot with me and it may with you as well, but I would, Think about what are you doing this for? Because you might not need to work 12 hours a day if you're just playing for freedom. And then you won't need to compare yourself into other people because some of you will feel like, oh man, wh why is he or she uh, having more energy, more time, more creativity? What's wrong with me? Like something's missing. I'm comparing myself to these other people and and I just feel like, I'm not able to perform at their level. Well, they're playing for the game. You're playing for freedom. It's different. A person just playing for freedom, it can be very motivating. But once you hit that freedom piece, once you hit that level, what keeps you going? Whereas the game is the cycle. It gives you energy. This is my point. Find something that gives you energy. I'm able to do this all day. I've been, I look at my aura ring last couple of weeks. I'm like, I'm confused. Five, six hours, six and a half hours of sleep. Like I've been, I'm not saying that's good. That's not good. Uh, but I've been pushing it. And some of you may say, well, that'll catch up to you. And I'm like, hmm, yeah, it's not ideal right now. I'm like, ah, I still got good energy. I just think there's things undescribable to science that if you're doing something that gives you energy in life, it's a everlasting fuel. Now I'm welcome to be, I, life may humble me once I have a family and once 10 years from now, but um, 
again, my belief around work is one that is not limiting. I... Yes. And so once you realize which one you want to be, it becomes effortless, it becomes easier. So I encourage you all just to sit and write and think, what am I actually doing this for? Because don't compare yourself to me if you're playing for freedom or anybody else playing for the game. Free belief shifts to unlock hours of productive low stress work. Let's get more specific. Has anybody put, put, do the thing in the past? If you've ever asked, said, oh man, I really need to do this. Oh, I gotta do this. I need to do this. I, if I don't do X, Y, Z, oh, stress, stress, stress. Of course. The belief shift that we need to come to is it's not I need to do this, it's I get to do this. No one is asking you to do a business. You chose to. You could go get a job. You could go work in a mine for six months and make 100K. You can take all the stress out of your, running your own shit. Remember that what we get to do is a gift and it's a choice. You do not have to do this. So when you catch yourself in the, I need to, remember, didn't you choose this? Aren't you doing what you wanted to do in your life? It gives you meaning. Because the I need to puts pressure on yourself. It creates stress. So every anytime you catch yourself in the I need to, like, ah, oh, if I don't do this, it's like, hold on. I get to coach 30 athletes. I get to run a gym. I get to run a six-figure business. I get to work towards making a six-figure business. Just remember, remember who picked it. Next. The perfectionism monster that used to plague me, but I killed him. And this is partly how I did it. There's this all or nothing mentality that a lot of our clients and people that we know also have, and we apply it to our business sometimes. And perfection has roots in your upbringing the trauma, the things you experienced growing up. Uh, for me, it was having a mother with very uh, extreme high standards. Um, Mary, Mary Saad, we are not related, but she, uh, we're both Egyptian, me half, her full. And we could both relate to that extent, having, if you, many of you can, if you have uh, more traditional or like uh, stricter parents. And the standard can be very high. You've got to do things exactly how it's meant to be done. And this, if the bar is up here, if you don't perform to that level, then anything below there is seemed as a failure or not worthy of doing, or you feel uh, like a failure if you don't. So to protect yourself, it's perfection or nothing. The flip is adopting a mentality and acceptance that your first attempt is going to suck. And I would encourage you all to make it suck because there's a lot of stress and overwhelm in the beginning of a new task, of a new business, of a new thing. And you're like, oh, I gotta do this. No, start off with the intention to do it badly. If you begin a new task with like, you know what? New assignment, new X, new Y. I haven't done this before. I'm, I'm just going to do it badly to begin with. And like say it to yourself. If you just, it's not enough. Sometimes if you think it's like, you know what? Let me release the expectation of this and acknowledge that it's going to probably not be very good. It's supposed to be like the first time you 
you make out with somebody, the first time you have sex with somebody, the first time you start a business, the first time you drive a car. Imagine if you had the expectation that you were going to be a superstar. No. And so I feel like I, I observe that a lot of you carry this uh, draining energy of having this, I have to be up here for every new task I do. And that is draining. I was like, oh, it's like when I write or make a new video, you're like, I have to do this video 17 times to make it perfect. No, do it badly to begin with. Maybe do a second take and be done. When I filmed all the videos for this productivity masterclass, I was under a time crunch. I only had two hours. I wanted to refilm some stuff. I couldn't have to go put it out. It was done. Now you're all here. Yeah, so you can move a lot faster if you adopt this mentality. You can move a lot faster and with less emotional weight. Third, last one, work capacity. If we acknowledge that in the gym, I lift some weights and I get stronger every week, every month, every year, yourself, your clients, why don't also we acknowledge that with our work capacity in our businesses, in our life? Some of you may compare to me, you say, oh my God, he's working all day. Or, or, or look at uh, um, this person or that person. I don't want to put myself in the same sentence as like Hormozy or Gary Vee. Like I'm not trying to do that. But like, let's, let's say you're comparing to them. It's like, oh, look at him. Look at her. How do they work so much? Well, they built that over decades. Uh, so I know some of you in here that I've coached and work with now, you might get to two, three hours and you feel fatigued. Well, the goal would be to get to 2.5 hours, add an extra half an hour. So it's, an, a, again, another perspective reframe because a, a lot of the draining energy that we experience is just here. It's actually not your nervous system. Well, it's being caused by your brain to your nervous system, but a lot of it is psycho-emotional. So I just want to like release a lot of that for you because I just don't hold on to a lot of that baggage and it just gives me energy. And the reframe for you guys, the analogy is you guys all know that you don't go in the gym from zero to five days. You, you guys all know, do that with your clients. You, uh, I want to train every day, coach. Hold on, cowboy. <laughs> you only train once in the last three weeks, four weeks. We don't want you to get injured. I don't want you to get overwhelmed in this sense. So let's build up. I've built mine up over, I don't know, 10 years. Like since I was 15, 16 years old, since I was getting up at five, 6 a.m. as a young basketball athlete, just hungry, a dog. So with that in mind, don't expect to go from two, three hours a day to eight hours a day. Otherwise you, that feeling and perception of feeling like a failure will ensue and you won't be inspired or encouraged to keep going. I'm not going to read every line you guys can and or watch it back. So like I said, if you're at three hours per day right now, progressively overload your work capacity. All right. I can only do a deep work block of two hours now. Let me see if I can grow 2.2. With the strategy of, of today, we should get, all of you should get an extra 10, 30, 10, 20, 30%. You adapt. Uh, people ask me, it's like, how do, you, how do you do it? How do you work so long so much? I've, I've adapted. The muscle of my work tolerance has adapted. Yours will too, given you also have the parameters of health in place, sleep, stress, environment, mindset, psychology. And then there's the question of that you guys will, I know is coming. Well, do you just work all day then? When do you take a break? How do you know? when to rest. You guys can 
drop in the comments if you want. This is the answer. I loved it. It's from Homozi. When your output per unit of time starts to drop significantly. It's like a, almost like an engineering term, but it's very mechanical. When your output per unit of time begins to drop significantly. So uh, your efficiency, like your ability to get work done, like crosses, drops over a threshold where it is no longer uh, productive. For me, what I have felt in the past is like a tension and pressure in my chest that builds. Like I get this angst, I'm like I've got to get out of this room. It builds, it builds, and then I do. I don't feel that as much now, but that's one sign and cue for me. So I'm observant of it and I reset. How I think about resets in the middle of my day, because this is another strategy for you guys that has helped me a lot. It's not that you sit down, work for eight hours in a row. That's not exactly what we're saying. You can, you can stop when you find the joy for the work disappearing. You can. I'm mindful that there's going to be also a lot of work, some of the work that we do that won't be, in, in, we won't enjoy. Meaning resistance is building up. You could. I'd be mindful that sometimes you just have to push through the resistance, right? It's like, okay, you got to acknowledge it. Do you just have to keep pushing through? Is this just uncomfortable part of doing the work or is this something else? <laughs> you can do voice. I don't know if you guys saw the messages. There's two things that I do that I encourage you guys to do that some of you may already do already, uh, I'm sure, but these are strategic. All of you, most of you train. Most of you watch some type of escapism and, and meditation or journaling, but most of you just do it without a lot of strategic thought about where it's placed in your day. How I would think about placing where to take a break is after a long deep work session. If you don't know what deep work means, I'll explain it soon, but after a bout of strategic, conscious, intentional, focused work. After something that is fatiguing you cognitively, it's like you, you push to the limit of your capacity and then you put in place a reset. You're gonna train anyway. You might as well put it at the end of a block, like a run, like a walk. Whatever you can fit within your schedule. If it's night, most of us read Netflix, something. Uh, I think, I wonder um, if people think that I don't do these things, like they put me on a pedestal. Uh, I, so I'm, I'm mindful like, yeah, like, once I heard like Hormozy say, like he watches like, his thing is like, he'll just watch binge Netflix for like an hour or two. I'm like, oh, that, I don't know about you guys, but that helps me. It's like, oh, wait, you can you can make 50, 100 million dollars a year and you can still do that? Because I think we think they're like superheroes. It's like, oh, it almost like gave me permission that it's, it's okay to not be on. And I guess I want to give you guys permission to do that too. And so that can be a reset for you. Before we go to the next, I'll open it up to you guys if you want to. I'll just let it breathe for 20, 30 seconds and you can share anything you're thinking or talking about. Al, in your experience, do you find that scheduling um, these breaks in is more effective than being intuitive? Because um, I've I've grappled with both of these scenarios where, you know, I, I wait till my output of time drops significantly um, and then I go for a run. But sometimes I find that's highly varied. I, I might be able to punch out four or five hours of riding all at once and then I would miss my block for a run if if it was scheduled, scheduled in. So, you know, what, what do you think? 
would be more effective? Do you need to open up your schedule so you can be intuitive or do you need to block it? And even if you're in a deep work or even if you don't feel like your output has diminished, take it anyway. That's a great question. I think what I would suggest would kind of be in the middle, meaning you set an intention of where you suspect fatigue to onset, like let's say at the end of a three hour block, but it has some mobility. You don't have to actually stop at that time. If you need to keep going, you can. If you need to go earlier, you can. So I would have some fluidity in, here's the intention, I wanna do it at 12, but it's a plus minus 90 minutes. I know for everybody's schedule, that's not gonna work. Some of you are like, that's not gonna work. You can't have as much fluidity, I know. Do your best, try and anticipate, schedule it in. Even just 10 to 20 minutes of going outside, resetting your mind and body makes a significant significant difference. Cool. I'll give it another 15 seconds if anyone wants to jump. That's a great point, Mary. Mary said, I find training drains my energy more than it serves me as a break. Because some of you are training real hard and it can be depleting. In that case, I would put that towards the back end of a day, if you can, and then you would pick something, Mary, that is energy giving. A walk, uh, some yoga in the sun, um, some meditation outside. You'd find the threshold that gives you the activity that gives you energy, but isn't fatiguing. That's a great example. Can I actually ask a question real quick? Oh, let's go, Jai. Oh, oh shoot one. Um, do you ever delegate your time to do a specific task and then when you've started doing it, like it's just the juices aren't flowing or it's not clicking? Do you ever just alter it from there or do you stick with it? Can you give me an example? Oh, if I sat down to maybe make a kind of creative post for like social media or something like that and it's just one of those days where nothing's coming to you or you can't put together what you'd want. Um, do you often pivot or do you kind of stick with it and just try and knuckle in and get it done? It depends. A lot of creative writers will tell you, uh, creatives will tell you, you stick in the muck. You stay in the mud and you see what you can find because often wait, waiting in the mud, you can find jewels, okay? In another sense, some people need to build momentum to tasks. So... For example, you might, all right, I'm not, it's not happening right now. Give yourself X amount of time to try and find the, the gold. 10 minutes, 20 minutes. If you can't find anything, you can build on another task and come at it from another perspective. I guess you would have to ask yourself, am I just being impatient? Or is like, what? where's the block? What's the actual issue here? And then being like, do you just need to do it badly to start with again? Like, is, is it just coming to the expectation of just like, like, what do you mean you're not finding it? Like, like, yeah, I would think about those. Yeah, it's obviously like not a black and white thing. Um, I'd say I'd probably sway towards the side of saying, like using it as a form of procrastination where you're like, oh, this isn't, this isn't working. Um, and just giving yourself as a bit of an excuse, but I guess everyone's different with that kind of thing. Well, let's have a look. There's some good comments um, and you guys can do voice. I'd love that too. Georgia, on my days where there is nothing rigid schedule, I just have a task list when I'm done with one task, I move to the next one, not linked to time. Okay, so that's like task flow. Beck, you can't force flow. Sometimes it just ain't there. Yeah, I don't think you can force it. It, it kind of comes by creating an environment and a situation that is conducive to getting in a flow state, which is many of the things I'm going to show you. 
and Anthea, some of the best creative content is where I push through resistance and perfectionism. Do you see that, Jai? Oh, yeah. And that's by someone who's like pretty successful and has put out a lot of stuff. Slay. Slay him. <laughs> I see you marrying too. Slay. <laughs> I might just add as well. Yeah. I feel like... Um, Whenever I get in that rut, it's because I'm making my, for instance, Instagram post, I'm making the post mean too much about me mm. and make it mean too much about some outcome. I'm just trying too hard to control an outcome. And I think when you realize that, you're like, fuck, okay, let's just, just do it. And my intention will be to just like, I don't know, be consistent or like, help at least one person and then I feel like I can be like oh okay it's it's not a big deal so then I just do it you drop the expectation yeah <laughs> it's good it's really good uh, some it's of a my song. <laughs> it is 100 percent for those uh, Marion is the reason I use this word now so <laughs> uh, thank, thank her some of the best pieces of content, the, the, the most engaging, the, the, the things that have just come to me that you guys have loved as well, have come from frustrations, annoyance, and just a moment, like a moment of like fucking, ah, this, the, you know, the reason we're here, I didn't plan to do this. This is all in a strategic, let me try and make some money and create a masterclass. No, the unit, this might sound, sound woo to some of you, but it's fine. I was getting signals from people, the universe, and they kept coming up and it started to annoy me. I'm like, okay, I need to make something to solve this problem. So I was listening. I'm just, I was observing. And I don't know, some of you might have saw the, the piece of content. I was going for a walk. It was raining. It was thunder. I just had a thought. It just came to me. Like I would listen and like uh, ride the wave of the moments that come to your head. Cause a lot of you have really creative, silly things that you judge, that you judge in your head, that you, that part of you is like, Oh, should I share it? And you don't, you're self-conscious, you're insecure. Will they like me? What will they think? And as a result, you lose some of the best, most inspiring <sighs> moments to connect with people. So I just want to give you guys permission that like Ben, Ben in here, Ben DiCiaccio, the story that we shared, like, fuck, like very, per go on my Instagram, his Instagram, if you want to say it's like very personal, very intense, like really, he didn't have to share that. He, he wasn't going to initially. It's pushing through that fear. All right. Love this. This is probably why we'll go over because we'll have such a good combo. Let's go habits. Let's get more granular. I'm not going to give you something complex here. I'm going to go dot point list. These are some major but simple things that done consistently. Done consistently. Can I have profound impact? All right. Number one, consistent wake sleep times plus minus one hour. Yes, on weekends too. Number one, the biggest difference. If you have a family, I know some of you have children. Uh, ben Can, my friend, mentor, call, uh, business partner. The man gets up around 4 a.m. as I know some of you get up similar times as well. Because he has two children, another one on the way, his deepest, most focused work is when the house is dead quiet. Something I'll probably have to do as well when I have a family. And something that I would consider for all of you to bite the bullet on. If you're noticing that when your day begins, 9 a.m., 10 a.m., there's just distraction all around you, you have to create blocks in an environment that is non-distracting. This third point, 
some see as a luxury. I see as just what is better in most situations. Um, a lot of people wake up tired and groggy because their alarm pulls them out of non-REM deep sleep stage three or four. When you get pulled out of deep sleep, instead of your light REM sleep stage one, two, your likelihood to feel tired and groggy and fatigued is significantly higher. You're being ripped out of this very uh, deep, like uh, was that theta wave sleep where every, like you are in deep sleep and being ripped out of it can create more latency, more time to come back to your baseline. An alarm doesn't know when you're sleeping. Instead, I would encourage you guys to get uh, wake up via the light. I wake up via the sound, birds. Uh, I know some of you, it's not gonna be reliable. I would set an alarm as a backup, but I would encourage you to wake up when your eyes open. Just test it, okay? If you are completely reliant on alarms, you can also go a light. You can look up an alarm light. I'll put it in the notion for you and it will wake you up with light, which is much more conducive to what we've evolved to do and won't rip you out of sleep. It'll gradually take you out. Hydration. I've got the Pellegrinos on deck. So, underrated, water. Many of you health professionals, but how many of you drink 750 to one liter of water within the first half an hour to hour of waking? Not too many of you. Don't, don't let one of the easiest things to improve your energy and cognition like limit you. This one right here I've underlined. It has been so impactful for me and clients of mine. This is not just N of one. This is like N of many. As quickly as you can, do your best to get outside in the light for 15 to 30 minutes, walking, looking in the direction of the sun. Huberman has talked about this at nauseum. However, the noticeable difference I noticed to my energy, my attention, my focus, my arousal is large as my clients is as well. There are hormonal reasons this occurs and this will also help your sleep later in the night because the production of melatonin will occur earlier and you will feel sleepier earlier. So not only are we helping the top end of the day, we're helping the, we're helping the bottom end of the day. So it's a cycle. If a great question. What if you wake up and it's still dark? Well, this is when I'm going to get into the lighting piece. Okay. Stay tuned. If you wake up and it's still dark, you're going to max out all the lights you have available to you in your home. Now the overhead lights are often not enough. There are some lighting panels that I recommend you get. One, my favorite brand, starting with Philips Hue. Uh, 6,000 lux into my retina. And I will show you why that has such an impactful effect, but it would be invest in bright lighting. Create your own sun in your indoor environment as bright as possible. I know I've got someone from the UK, I think here, or bought a ticket. UK's dark. More light. So important here. If you're not already doing it or not doing it consistently, don't do it. Time blocks and calendar. I can't remember who said it. Oh, Mac, I think it was. Mac, a Google Calendar, make it your best friend. Schedule time blocks in your calendar. This is not a Google Calendar time management masterclass, but it's, it's a big part of that. What gets measured gets improved. If you're not using a Google Calendar, it is by far one of the most important habits to reducing overwhelm. People think it's like, oh, it's rigid and structured. Where's the freedom? No, discipline equals freedom. As Jocko says, it gives you predetermined outcomes. So you have confidence and peace of mind. It's like, oh, I know when I'm doing that. Middle of the day, Movement and training reset. This is big for me. It's going to be big for many of you is you have that reset space. We spend a lot of time indoors. Going outdoors is going to be extremely beneficial. Um, I'm going to talk about eye gaze later on, but getting looking out into the horizon is very relaxing to your nervous system. I would um, just caution nocebo, which is the opposite of placebo. 
Um, one time I thought I forgot my blue blockers when we were uh, going to stay at an Airbnb somewhere in Victoria. And I was like, oh no, my blue blockers. How am I going to sleep? I had this belief around sleep that I'm sensitive to sleep and this, that, and the other, and it was limiting me. But I just, I got a, some, uh, I rely on these tools because they do help me. Uh, but also that belief can cause more disruption and make things worse. Because when you don't do any one of these things, you might think, oh no. So just be very mindful that you're very adaptable. You're a human, you're robust. You will be okay if one or two of these things don't get done. Habits. If all, if all of you do these seven consistently, I know it's not, oh my God, this is so simple. Well, yeah. This is not eat sticks of butter. This is master the foundations. See if anyone knows that reference. Now, time blocking and deep work. Those who can master their focus can produce higher quality output in less time. This is very important. There's a book by Cal Newport called Deep Work. Highly recommend. We're going to define deep work versus shallow work. Deep work is distraction-free concentration that pushes your cognitive capabilities to their limit for meaningful growth. Most of the, the highest ROI time, return on investment will be deep work. Shallow work does not require intense focus or high level cognitive capacity. Responding to social media, admin, can multitask. This is deep work. If you can master the skill of deep work and you can do more deep work, your output per unit of time skyrockets. And we're going to be talking about creating an environment to raise that. I think this is one of the greatest skills you can have in the age that we're in now that is constant distraction and constant dopamine. Y'all get, t we, I don't know, me included, like three seconds of Instagram or TikTok flies by. Boring, boring. Just watch someone go through social media. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> like, we're just, we're so quick to like not sit with something. So be uh, mindful that you will need to build this muscle of deep work. I'm going to talk about how your environment is conducive to creating a deep work environment versus a shallow work environment. i give an example of this type of open area versus a closet. Another piece for reducing overwhelm is there are Cal in his book documented psychological benefits to engaging in deep work. It gives us a sense of meaning, fulfillment and satisfaction, a sense of purpose. So I would ask yourself, if you're not fulfilled by what you're doing right now, how much shallow work and chasing your tail are you doing versus deep problem solving, sitting down, creating something? Al, can I add something to that that I think might be helpful for us? Yeah. Um, for, for those that don't understand what I do, I run a couple of gyms. Um, and for about five or five or six years, I was consumed by shallow work. And you guys may have experienced this too, where your whole life is just putting out fires, putting out fires, dealing with messages, getting an email. And I, I was stuck in that perpetual cycle. Um, and one of the things that I found that I wasn't honoring is I actually didn't give myself an avenue for deep work. There was nothing actually meaningful to work on. And so one of the things that I did was I essentially said, well, what, what do I love to do the most? And what I love to do is write. Um, and so I started writing. Um, and in the first, the first uh, kind of initiative or the first iteration of me writing was just to write emails out to people who had subscribed to an email list and i had like three thousand people as a result of releasing free programs and stuff like that and then 
that was a really great first iteration and did allow me to sit down and do something what I what I found meaningful. And then that evolved into, hey, I'm really loving this. What happens if I actually wrote a, a, a larger kind of larger body of an e uh, of a newsletter? And so I released this product called a, you know, it's called the Alley Oop, and it was a it's a paid newsletter that people subscribe to. And it's about 15,000 or 20,000 words. And I write one every single month now. Um, and it it has been an absolute game changer because not only do I get to now have an outlet for deep work, um, but it allows me to apply what I'm writing about in the newsletter to my own business. So I'm honoring that too. Um, and I, I found that one of the things that, but perhaps if I didn't do that, I, I'd, I'd be in a very different place and probably me and Al wouldn't even know each other because I'm, I'm almost certain that Al first subscribed to the newsletter as, as his main way of interacting with my ideas around running a business. Right. And so one of the things that I'd recommend if, and I hope hopefully not stealing your thunder here, Al, no. is that you almost need to give yourself permission to find what deep work looks like for you. Um, and uh, otherwise, you will be consumed with with the shallow, shallow work, as Al said. Um, and you know, deep works this amorphous idea. W what even is it? You know, how do I, you know, do deep work whilst writing an email to a client? Or you know, it, it, it's it's this amorphous concept. So I'd, I'd encourage you guys to have a think about that if you if you're not already. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. That's that's such a great insight. Um, I encourage you guys to, because you all have your own really valuable experiences, and I encourage you guys to share your own too. Um, I know there's a few gym owners in here. Shout out. This, th you're not paying me to say this. Um, go look up Carl Alley newsletter. Um, it has some incredible, very practical uh, business jewels in every single one that have changed my game and my life. Okay. Let's go here. All right. The business fallacy. Many of us are just appearing busy, like I used to do, tricking ourselves into thinking we're being productive. The more podcasts, the more books, the more X I input, the better I am. No. Do not mistake activity for achievement. Do not mistake activity for achievement. I used to think I was really busy. I was just consuming so much, just learning so much. And I wasn't actually getting a lot of output done, a lot of productive work done. So an example of what isn't deep work is not just watching a podcast or just reading a book for the sake of reading a book. It's like, what are you, how are you stretching your mind? How are you uh, applying what you're learning? Shallow work gives the impression that we're being productive when we're just being busy. So if you say you're really busy, I don't think the goal is to be busy. Is the goal to be busy? Like I try not to use that language. Because busy can tend to imply this like, oh, out of control, I'm just chasing my tail. I'm productive, I'm focused. So perspective on this is what I used to do. I was just shallow work, chasing busyness. Are you doing that? Ask yourself if you're honest. Am I mistaking activity for achievement? Sit with that. Some principles of what deep work, deep work firm. Leave and put shallow work, and I'll show you an example of a calendar, into later in the day or after a fatiguing task. Deep work is done when cognition is the highest. I will share this with you guys later. Bill Gates has something called Think Week. He goes away for one week, brings a couple of books and does